So now I will turn things over to Dr. Andrew Berry. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, very nice to see so many people here, especially on such a frigid occasion. Um, David, I'm sure, will warm our hearts. Uh, it is a real honor. Uh, it really is an honor for me to introduce one of my scientific heroes, uh, David Reich. Uh, David, who, as I tell my students, does the best and coolest science being done today. End of story. Uh, the stuff, and you're about to discover that, uh, the stuff David does is stunning. Um, he started off as a physicist right here at Harvard. These events are actually normally introduced by Melissa Franklin. Some of you will know Melissa. Uh, he worked in Melissa's lab, and she's unfortunately out of town. She was rather disappointed. I think she wanted to indulge in some form of ritual humiliation. Uh, uh, David, however, knew better and moved on to biology. Uh, went to Oxford. He's, so he's getting smarter and smarter. Um, uh, to do a PhD in statistical genetics, um, then wavered, thought of going to, well, it did go to medical school at um, Harvard MIT, um, but then uh, realized there were many more interesting things to do than curing disease, um, uh, and has been on the faculty at Harvard Medical School Genetics Department since 2003. Since 2013, uh, he has been a Howard Hughes Medical Institute investigator, which sounds obscure, but was, is mind-blowingly prestigious. Um, he's also talking of prestige, um, won lots of awards despite his relative youthfulness, uh, including, I noticed a 2017 award, it's true it was joint, uh, but this is a real award. It's not just some medal or something, this was a million dollars, um, so he's serious. Um, three extraordinary achievements. One is, and they all pertain to the use of ancient DNA, which you're about to learn about in some detail. One is the deep past. The notion that we, wonderful, exalted us, homo sapiens, are not the product of some sort of vectored evolution where we've got better and better over time. No, what we are is the product of a lot of sort of behind the bush sex with Neanderthals and other close relatives. It's a murky, twisted history we have. Two, the not so deep past, and that's what David's going to be talking about tonight. The lens and the precision that David and his group can bring to bear on human historical and prehistorical questions using ancient DNA is extraordinary. And finally, I'm an evolutionary biologist. David is changing the way we're doing our science. Normally, we're interpolating, we're trying to understand what happened in the past from the distribution of things in the present. Now we have a time machine, ancient DNA, helmed, curiously, I like this vision, little goggles, by David Reich, which takes us back in the past and we can actually see the processes that we've been reconstructing laid out before us actually happening. The, the world of ancient DNA is changing science in extraordinary and wonderful ways and it's going to be a privilege to hear some of those ways from David right now. Thank you. Do, pe do people hear me? Um, um, okay. So thank you for, for that amazing introduction. Um, so I'm going to be talking to you about, I'm going to be trying to, in this talk, uh, to really... Um, leave you with one primary uh, idea, if you, have, if you just take one idea away from it, which is that these two subcontinents of Eurasia of about equal size and historically about equal numbers of people, although relative numbers have fluctuated a bit over time, um, have a remarkably parallel history of, of being a mixture of three major, major ancestral populations, some of which are non-indigenous and some of which have similar sources. Um, there's profound differences also, but I wanted to highlight those parallelisms, and hopefully you'll come away from the talk um, seeing these two subcontinents in more similar in ways. So I'm going to begin by talking about what's happened since 2010, which is the coming online of a new scientific instrument. So um, I'd argue that this is a powerful new scientific instruments similar to the way that microscopes were powerful when they first introduced, that they made it possible to look into worlds that were never previously looked at, 
Um, and once the measure of a new scientific instrument and how powerful it is, is that when you turn it to look at something that's never been looked at before, like the world of microbes, when people first started using a microscope in the 17th century, you realize that there are things in the world you never previously imagined. And what happens when we use ancient DNA again and again is that when we look at past peoples who have not yet been looked at before with regard to the question of how they're related to each other and to people living today, the stories don't conform to the ones that we thought were most likely before again and again and again. So in 2010, what happened was that it began possible for the first time to extract whole genome sequences from ancient humans who lived thousands or even tens of thousands, and in some case, even hundreds of thousands of years ago. Prior to that, for several decades, it had been possible to extract little snippets of DNA, but the increased information that comes from sequencing the whole genome, which is uh, literally hundreds of thousands of times longer than those snippets that, was, that were being sequenced before makes it possible to ask and answer questions that are profoundly more different and, and more precise. So typically the way ancient DNA analysis goes these days is we start with a, a skeletal remain. Uh, usually, I'm, I work on humans, but people also work on animals and plants. This is an ear bone, a petrous bone, so it's the part of the skull that contains the inner ear region, and in particular the cochlea, uh, or the um, otic capsule, which contains uh, a key organ of hearing. Um, and this turns out, as the people in this field have discovered, to have about 100 times more DNA per unit of bone powder than any other part of the skeleton that people have analyzed, and so we preferentially study that part if we can obtain that skeletal element. So in a clean room where the goal is to protect the sample from the people handling it, who have much more DNA, of course, than the, the bone that's been in the ground for thousands of years, we isolate the part of the bone that we're interested in, either by drilling or by using another methodology. We uh, grind it into powder or pulverize it in some other way. We release the DNA in a watery mix that removes the uh, protein and mineral content um, and hopefully uh, inhibiting molecules that will prevent the reactions from going forward where we want to use to extract the DNA. And we convert the DNA into a form that can be sequenced. Since uh, about 2000, the price of DNA sequencing, as probably many of you know, has dropped by about a factor of a millionfold. And that, combined with the more sensitive ways of extracting DNA and methods for isolating the parts of the DNA that we're interested in, for the first time makes it possible to obtain large amounts of DNA from ancient humans. It's kind of a miracle that DNA preserves for so long, but it turns out to be a rather stable molecule. And in the right conditions, we can often get it out of samples that are thousands or tens of thousands of years old. So as a result of this implementation of these series of technologies, the amount of the number of human samples with genome-wide data has rapidly, rapidly increased from the first samples that were published in 2010 to more than 2,000 published samples today. Um, and it's a really hyper-exponential growth um, with a more than hundredfold increase since 2013. And so with an increase in the amount of data, this dramatic, every year or two it becomes possible to ask and answer questions that really couldn't be addressed with the much smaller sample sizes. In this talk, I'm going to be telling you about the application of these large sample sizes to two parts of the world, to Europe and Central Asia and the boundaries, borders of South Asia. So I talk about this in the book that I published last year, um, and, um, and uh, this talk is really largely based on chapters 5, which is called The Making of Modern Europe, chapters 6, which is the collision uh, that formed India, um, and maybe I think it's chapter 11, which is called The Genomics of Inequality, but it's considerably updated relative to each of those chapters, especially the South Asian chapter. So I'm going to start in the first half of my talk about Europe, which is the part of the world we now understand best from ancient DNA. And that's not because it's more important than other parts of the world, but it's because it was in the backyard of the people who developed much of the technology for ancient DNA. So still, uh, the great majority of the 
more than 2,000 samples for which there's ancient DNA, whole genome data, are from Europe. And we have really exquisite profiling of the changes in ancestry and um, types of ancestry over time. I'm going to start there because the information we have is so rich and surprising, and it will also set up the questions that we can, are beginning to learn about also in South Asia. So in this beginning of the talk, I'm going to talk about two um, cultural processes that are documented not from DNA, but from other lines of evidence. So one of them, shown on left, is the evidence from archaeology, from the study of material remains left behind, of a very dramatic phenomenon that occurred, which is that after 9,000 years ago, uh, agriculture for the first time spread into Europe from its homeland in the Near East. So farming probably developed 12 to 11,000 years ago in the eastern part of present-day Turkey or northern Syria, uh, the, uh, that area. Um, and uh, then within a couple of thousand years, started spreading in many different directions. One of them was into Europe, uh, probably from Anatolia. In fact, we know almost certainly from Western Anatolia, present-day Turkey. So a question was, was that spread of agriculture, which transforms the archaeological record, the types of pots and implements people leave behind, and is very clearly documented there, was it accomplished by movement of people? Or were people copying the technology, as often happens when people copy, for example, use of cell phones or other technology, even though it's not made by people of their own group? That's been a big question in archaeology. Was it pots or people? Was it the spread of ideas, or was it movement of people, or some combination of the two? Another type of cultural evidence that's very relevant to this is the distribution of languages across Eurasia. And here I show the, the distribution of Indo-European languages across Europe. These are a closely related family of languages, which it can, is, is, is responsible for almost all the languages of Europe, as well as northern India, Iran, and Armenia. But there are a few exceptions in Europe. For example, Basque in northwestern Spain, Hungarian, uh, which is an island within Europe of a different type of uh, uh, family of language, and, Finno and, and languages in, in Finland and Estonia and Lapland, which are of different origin as well. So a question is, why do people speak such closely related languages? Latin uh, Romance languages are only a subset of these languages. We speak one of these languages. And what process spread these closely related languages, which are highly unlikely to descend from a common ancestor much more than eight or 10,000 years ago? So in 2014 and 2015, the first whole genome data from ancient Europeans was beginning to be available. And it was very clear by that time that what had happened was that the spread of farming into Europe had been achieved by large-scale movement of people. So there was data at that time from European hunter-gatherers, the people who were the exclusive inhabitants of Europe prior to 9,000 years ago. And they had a very characteristic ancestry type, um, shown in dark blue in these bar plots, each of which is supposed to represent a sing does represent a single individual we analyze data from. And uh, sorry, represented in green in these plots. And um, after 9,000 years ago, there was a large-scale movement into Europe, first into Greece and into the Balkans near Greece, um, of this type of ancestry, dark blue, which is, very, which is almost a perfect match to the ancestry we have data from, from, the, from Anatolian farmers from Western Anatolia from about 8,500 years ago. So it's very clear that there was large-scale movement into Europe of people very similar to Western Anatolians, and it pinpoints the likely origin of the movement of people that brought this new technology. It wasn't a complete replacement. In, 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 in the Balkans, initially, there was an almost complete replacement, but over the next two or 3,000 years, the local hunter-gatherer populations mixed a little bit with the farmers, and they persisted actually at the fringes of Europe, which were not farmable, too far north or in mountainous regions. And the overall proportion of farmer of hunter-gatherer ancestry settled at around 20% um, across Europe, but varying in different places. But if you look at Europeans today, there's a third component of ancestry, um, which is shown in red here. 
And so that's the situation we were in in 2014 and 15. We knew that in some populations, especially in Northern Europe, uh, about half the ancestry, in fact, the single largest component of ancestry, simply didn't exist in multiple sites more than 5,000 years ago. So when did that third ancestry arrive? It must have been sometime more than 5,000 or sometime after 5,000 years ago. So here is going to be a summary of what was found with genetic data um, in a series of papers beginning in 2015 and uh, from our group and others. So what I'm showing here is a principal component analysis plot. And I'm going to walk you through this because I'm going to refer to this several times um, and also tell you about this approach a little bit. So what you see here are dots. Each one corresponds to a present day or recently living person, about a thousand dots drawn from the places shown on this map. So that's Europe and that's Arabia, just to orient you. And what the data consists of is the following. So we're looking at about 600,000 places in our DNA where people vary. So you probably mostly know that our DNA sequences are very similar to each other. So copies of 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 your genome, one from your mother and one from your father, they're 99.9% similar at positions you can line them up. So we're genetically extremely similar to each other, but our whole genome sequence is about 3 billion DNA letters long. And so one in a thousand of that is millions of differences. And it's those differences that tell us about history because those differences accumulate over time due to random mutations that have occurred. And they tell us how long it's been since any two genomes were separated because the more mutations separating genomes, the longer it's been since, time, uh, since they share a common ancestor. So the data consists of looking at about 600,000 positions where people are known to vary. For example, some people have an adenine, one of the four DNA letters, and some people have a cytosine, another of the four DNA letters. And so we look at these 600,000 positions, and you should think about it as a table with 600,000 rows, and we look at the 1,000 individuals there, so you should think about 1,000 columns, and in each cell of the table is a 0, 1, or 2, depending on whether you have two adenines, an adenine and a cytosine, that would be 1, or two cytosines, that would be 2. And then you multiply this table by itself to get an approximately 1,000 by 1,000 table, which shows how closely related every sample is to every other. And you perform a mathematical dimension reduction standard technique on this to most efficiently separate the samples from each other. And what's shown here, the axes are not shown, is a plot of the most efficient separation of these samples from each other and the second most efficient, the first versus the second principal component. And uh, without knowing the labels of where these individuals come, there's a remarkable pattern that emerges. So Europeans almost exclusively splay out along a gradient, a line here. Near Easterners, people from here, splay out along a line here with very few populations in between. These groups in between are mostly island Mediterranean groups, uh, which are, have plausible more recent contact between Europe and the Near East, as well as other groups with plausible more recent contact between Europe and the Near East. Um, in the bottom of this plot uh, tends to be groups in, of, from the Mediterranean, like Sardinians over here, like uh, uh, Levantine populations from Jordan and Israel over here. At the top are northern populations, like Lithuanians and British over here, and like people from the Caucasus over up there. And so this is a remarkable plot. I'm now going to turn these dots gray. Um, and so I'm going to show you where the ancient samples over time fall relative to the modern samples, because once you perform this principal component analysis on the ancient samples, you can then see how the modern samples relate to the ancient variation. So prior to 8,000 years ago, the hunter-gatherers position on the plot here. And this is very remarkable because they fall outside the variation of present-day West Eurasians. They are, fall beyond Europe in the direction of European differentiation from the Near East. And the correct interpretation of that, we can show, is that Europeans today are a mixture of groups like this and groups like this. That is, Europeans today are a mixture of hunter-gatherers and people from the Near East who arrived with farming and also through other processes that I'll tell you about shortly. The first farmers moved dramatically on this plot over on top of present-day Sardinians, 
and here are the Anatolian farmers. And uh, Sardinians today, at least some Sardinians, uh, we now think of them as a relatively isolated population that descends from some of the first farmers who spread into Europe without much impact of later movements that affected the rest of Europe. But you, at this time, uh, 8,000 years to 5,000 years ago, just don't see people like the bulk of Europeans today. Meanwhile, about 5,000 years ago in the steppe north of the Black and Caspian Sea, this group forms, and I'll tell you more about them shortly, and they fall on the extreme top of the European gradient. But people like present-day Europeans are still not there 5,000 years ago. But after 5,000 years ago, they suddenly appear. And the correct interpretation is they're a mix of people like this, people like this, and people like this, forming a gradient over here. And ever afterward, Europeans look like this. They fall in that area over there. So what happens? So a summary of what happens is that after 9,000 years ago, there was a large-scale movement of people spreading into Europe and bringing with them farming technology, and that this spread was accomplished to a large extent by movement of people, although with important elements of exchange in terms of culture and other elements with the local hunter-gatherers, especially at the periphery of Europe where uh, people could not immediately farm, so there was a long period of interaction um, when the hunter-gatherers and farmers learned from each other. Um, at this, after this time, this created a continent full of people with different proportions of first farmer and hunter-gatherer ancestry, but mostly first farmer ancestry. And then there was a later impact from the steppes north of the Black and Caspian Seas, and we can really show that this group, that these yellow samples that formed at the top of that gradient about 5,000 years ago are the source of this movement, and in fact are the single largest source of ancestry in many Europeans today. So there's two large-scale movements into Europe, one from the Near East via Anatolia, and the other from the steppe north of the Black and Caspian Sea about 5,000 years ago. And this is sufficiently late and sufficiently large-scale that it's very difficult to imagine that this movement from the steppe north of the Black and Caspian Seas was not a source of important languages that are spoken in Europe today and is uh, due to linguistic arguments which already favor the steppe as the source of Indo-European languages, at least some of the Indo-European languages in Europe. This makes the steppe spread the most likely explanation for the source of at least some of the Indo-European languages spoken in Europe today. So who were these people who were those yellow dots falling on the top of the gradient? Well, here's a skeleton from one of the individuals we analyzed from far eastern Europe, from the Samara Oblast in present-day Russia. And so this individual had a copper mace. It's just before bronze began to be used. Um, and these are amazing archaeological culture. So the Yamnaya were the first people who used uh, pastoralism and spread it out into the open steppe lands. Prior to the Yamnaya, there were many scattered groups that lived in the river valleys, and they had different cultures in different part of the steppe lands in this region. But nobody, or almost nobody, was in the very dry areas between the rivers. So these people took advantage of two very powerful inventions that had been invented just before that, not, ne not necessarily by them, but they quickly adopted them. One was the invention of the wheel, which had happened just before, um, and the other was the domestication of the horse, which possibly occurred by these people or certainly by some others in Central Asia. And these people hitched uh, their horses to wagons with wheels and used it to bring supplies out into the open steppe. And they were able to exploit the grasslands and the resources of the steppe in a way they had not exploited them before. And as a result, or possibly, or Somehow, these people spread very dramatically all the way from Hungary in Europe, in Central Europe, all the way to the Altai, Altai Mountains on the boundary of Mongolia today, and replaced many of these very disparate cultures before. So it's a very dramatic spread in the archaeological record, um, not just using more of the landscape that they occupied, um, but also spreading geographically and replacing or displacing or uh, living with other groups. Right. So I'm now going to talk about how this ancestry not only got to Central Europe, uh, to Germany and to Hungary, but actually got all the way to the extremes of Atlantic Europe in a case study. Um, so I'm going to first talk about Britain. So this is dates in the past. So Britain 
farming got to Britain rather late. So it gets to Greece about 8,500 years ago, but it gets to Britain only about 6,000 years ago. Prior to that, there are hunter-gatherers like the rest of Europe. And then around 6,000 years ago, there's at least a 99% replacement of the local hunter-gatherer population by farmers coming from mainland Europe. Um, it was a very dramatic event. Um, and here's a bunch of samples we reported data on at the beginning of 2018 um, uh, from first farmers from Europe uh, down to about 4,500 years ago. And you see that none of them have ancestry from the Yamnaya. And then suddenly, Stonehenge, the big stones at Stonehenge go up just at the end of this period, um, built by people with entirely first farmer ancestry. Then about 45 to 4,400 years ago, the reason we have pre such precise date is because of the incredible power of radiocarbon dating, you suddenly see ancestry like this. So there's a dramatic shift with a 90% population replacement in Britain, a second dramatic population replacement. So it's a minimum of 90% population replacement from people from the continent who replace the people who built Stonehenge almost with very little local mixture. And so what this is telling you is that there's a large scale movement, not just once, but twice in the history of this island. And these people are genetically extremely similar to people in Britain today, but these people are hardly related to people in Britain at all today. So now I'm going to give you another example, which we're trying to, we're going to publish in a couple of weeks, um, in Iberia. So uh, here's the pattern in Iberia. It's the same time period shown. So from 6,000 years ago, all first farmers, and then about the same time, you see for the first time people bringing ancestry from the east, from the Yamnaya. But here in Iberia, we detect a period of several hundred years of coexistence of these two groups, and then a population mixture event, where instead of a 90% population replacement, it's only a 40% population replacement. What that means is that if you take people living here, and you ask who were their ancestors, where were they living, uh, 10 generations ago, a few hundred years ago, that means 40% of those ancestors on the maternal and paternal lines would have been um, not in Iberia, probably, and 60% would have them have been in Iberia. But if you look at the coloring of these dots, so that tells you something else. So the coloring of the dots corresponds to the males in the individual, so the open circles are females, but on the males we can sequence their Y chromosome, which men inherit from their fathers, and we can determine whether it's characteristic of the first farmers of Europe or of uh, people from the steppe. And what you see in both Britain and especially impressively in Iberia is that essentially all the Y chromosomes after about 4,200 years ago are from the steppe. So that means that while only 40% of the percent 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 of the Y chromosomes do. And that's telling you that there's a social inequality that's associated with the movement of these new people into this region where the males are contributing much more to the next generations than the local males, the incoming males than to the local males. So this is the first part of my talk, and I'm going to now come to the second part of my talk, which is about genetic formation of South Asian populations in light of ancient DNA data. So in 2009, in one of the first paper that my, my colleagues and I were involved in publishing on South Asia out of a whole series, we um, d uh, analyzed variation from 25 very diverse groups in South Asia that we were collaborating on generating genome-wide data on with our colleagues in India. So no ancient DNA data here, but I'm actually showing you a plot from our paper in 2009. So this again is a principal component analysis, again about 600,000 variable places in the genome. Here, uh, uh, and I'll label these individuals. So. These are Europeans and central and and uh, these are European populations. These are East Asian populations as well as some a couple of groups in far northeastern India, which are genetically similar to Chinese or somewhat similar to Chinese. And most of the Indian groups fall here. So what we immediately noticed is that many of the groups in India form a gradient of different levels of proximity to uh, Europeans and Central Asians and Near Easterners. Um, and there were exceptions to this. For example, people who speak Austroasiatic languages, like Khazi or Mundari languages, 
and of course Tibeto-Burman languages over here, but we were focusing on the people who spoke, or the vast majority of the population of India in both North and South India, who speak Indo-European languages related to the languages spoken in Europe and Armenia and Iran, and Dravidian languages, which are the languages of much of the South of India. And we noticed this gradient, and we developed a lot of new statistical technology to understand what this gradient was. And the, we were able to show that this gradient was driven by population mixture. That is, that the people on this gradient with different levels of proximity to European, Central Asians, and Near Easterners were the result of at least one mixture event between groups with different levels of proximity to Europe. So we called these the ancestral North Indians and the ancestral South Indians. And the ancestral North Indians had some kind of relationship, um, not so deeply in time, only maybe many thousands of years rather than maybe tens of thousands of years to European, Central Asians, and Near Easterners. And the ancestral South Indians, the closest match we could find to them were Chinese or to indigenous people of the Andaman Islands in the Bay of Bengal, which are near Sumatra and in Indonesia and India and, and Myanmar. Um, and people in India today are mixtures in different proportions of these two ancestral populations, which are different from each other as Europeans and East Asians today. So we documented this in 2009, and we could assign proportions of mixture of ancestral North Indian-related ancestry, which ranged, this is not the full extent of the range, but from about 80% to about 20%. And really remarkably, it's correlated in South Asia and in India to two cultural phenomena. One is the speaking of languages. So people who have relatively higher proportions of ancestral North Indian ancestry tend to speak Indo-European languages, oops, more than Dravidian languages. And even within states of India, people of traditionally higher status in the traditional caste system tend to have relatively more ancestral North Indian ancestry than ancestral South Indian ancestry. So what that shows is that the process of language spread and the process of the definition of this traditional social status are both related to the mixture process that occurred in some way. So in the series of papers that we wrote subsequently, we tried to understand more about what happened. And we want to know in particular, what's the history behind the ANI-ASI mixture process? And we had three ideas in our head. And of course, the truth is probably none of these three ideas, but we had three hypotheses. So the three hypotheses were that what we're seeing is the effects of populations coming together during post-Ice Age migrations, which the big, the big melting happened after 18 and especially after 14,000 years ago. And even though South Asia was never glaciated, the landscape changed very dramatically, and perhaps that pushed new populations into contact that had not been pushed before. Another possibility is that what we're seeing is what happened in Europe, the spread of farmers to this region for the first time from the core region of farming in the Near East, instead of western, westward, as in Europe, eastward into South Asia. And it's very clear the archaeology documents that. The last possibility is that what you're seeing is events related to the collapse of the Indus Valley civilization and the rise of archaeological uh, intensification of archaeological cultures um, around the Gange Ganges after about 4,000 years ago. So these were three temporarily very distinct events, and we want to see if the genetic data could provide any information about whether the mixture correlated better to one of these times than to others. So in order to answer this, we develop new technology, new statistical technology for estimating dates of mixture, and it works like this. So here it's supposed to represent two chromosomes. So you, at every part of your genome, you have 23 pairs of chromosomes. These are the packages on which your DNA letters are stored. And so this is a cartoon of the two chromosomes that you might get on two copies of chromosome three, colored by whether they're ASI or ANI. And so if you look at the great-great-grandparents of someone today on their chromosome three, um, after their mixture of ANA, ANI and ASI, you might have a first-generation mix of them. Every generation, when you produce an egg or a sperm, you create one or two breaks in those chromosomes per generation, splice them together, and send a mixed chromosome down to your offspring. And you get one or two of these breaks every generation until today you have chunks of ancestry that reflect several generations of breaks. And by measuring the average size of these chunks, you know how long it's been since the mixture process initiated. You're basically, it's like you're chopping a salad at a constant rate, and you measure the sizes of the chunks, the dice size. And so that's what we did. We looked at the average dice size, 
And we estimated based on this that across South Asia, the mixture happened between two to 4,000 years ago on average, depending on the group, which very strongly suggested that the mixture happened in the last scenario after the collapse of the Indus Valley civilization um, and the beginning of the spreads of, uh, uh, of our new, new rise of new archaeological uh, cultures and urban intensification in the Gangetic Plain. So the summary of ha population history before ancient DNA is that South Asians Many South Asians are a mixture of at least two ancestral populations, ancestral North Indians and ancestral South Indians. They mixed convulsively after four to, between four to 2,000 years ago in a way that's related to the institution of caste and the spread of Indo-European languages. What happened next? So <clears throat> here's a paper that we're now trying to bring to publication, which is a very large scale study of ancient samples shown in red here co-analyzed with many, many modern populations shown in dots here. And so we are trying to make sense not just of the history, oops, not just of the history of uh, the, these populations shown in red, but also their relationship to the populations in South Asia. You see there's very little ancient DNA so far from South Asia. The only data we have is from the Swat Valley in present-day northern Pakistan, although that's very interesting data. So there's lots of stuff in this study, um, and I'm going to focus really on just one group of samples from here, the, from uh, Turkmenistan and Uzbekistan, which is particularly revealing, as well as here from Far Eastern Iran. So this is a site uh, from about 4,000 years ago called Gonor Tepe in Turkmenistan. It's a very impressive huge town, walled town. It was one of several built at that time uh, as part of what's called the Bactria Margiana archaeological complex, which is uh, one, uh, one of the great, one of the civilizations of the ancient world, which was really only discovered by archaeologists in the 1970s. And when we performed principal component analysis on the data uh, from more than 100 individuals from Bactria Margiana archaeological site, complex sites, from Gonor and three other sites, we got a plot like this. And what's very powerful about this plot, because we have so many samples, is that we not only observe a main cluster of samples, but we observe clear groups of outlier individuals. So these are peoples buried in the cemeteries on, around this town, but they're genetically not homogeneous. This would be like digging up a cemetery here. You would find perhaps a main cluster corresponding to the majority group, but you would find other groups and it would be telling you about the groups with which the main group was in cultural interaction. So prior to 4,000, broadly this group is similar to ancient Iranians that we also have data from, from around the same time. And then when you see the first individuals who are outliers from this group, prior to 4,000 years ago, there's a group of them that clearly are admixed, mixed with people related to Siberian hunter-gatherers and are presumably the hunter-gatherers of Kazakhstan and Central Asia, um, who are known archaeologically but we didn't have direct sampling from. But we think that what we're seeing is local hunter-gatherers being buried in these cities and coming into contact with the urban people of towns like this. <coughs> After 4,000 years ago, you see a new group appearing only then, and these people have Yamnaya steppe pastoralist ancestry, the same type of ancestry that gets into Europe after 5,000 years ago, and we see it appearing not just in the boundaries, the cemeteries of this town, but in multiple places in Kazakhstan and other parts of Central Asia just around this time. So it's clearly hitting this region at this time, but not before. <clears throat> and then finally, we find these three outlier individuals with South Asian admixture. Um, these are, we first found a girl buried in a pot um, who had a bit of South Asian ancestry. We found her about a year and a half ago and we noticed she had South Asian admixture. It was clearly coming up from the South and she was buried um, along with this main group. Um, and it's known that these people in uh, Gonor and these other BMAC, Bactria Margiana towns, were in cultural contact with the civilization to the south known as the Indus Valley Civilization. So we thought we might have an immigrant from the Indus Valley Civilization or other points in the Indus Valley. So we found this a year and a half ago, and we found, we collected more data because we thought that this was so interesting. Um, and we found two other individuals, and then we found another eight individuals from a town called Shari Shokta in far eastern Iran. 
So we now have eight individuals with ancestry like this, which are clearly migrants from South Asia, and the rest of their ancestry is Iranian-related, but it's not of this type. So they're not just South Asians mixing with the local people. These are migrants or descendants of early generation migrants from somewhere else. So <clears throat> here's the summary of what we think the data are showing. So these individuals from Gonor, from the Bactria Margiana complex, and Shari Shokta and Far East Iran are a mixture of two source populations, an ancient Iranian-related group and an ancient South Asian-related group without any steppe ancestry, not, no ancestry related to steppe pastoralists. This is the first layer a gradient that we see in South Asia, but this is a gradient that existed four or 5,000 years ago, not like the one today. After 4,000 years ago, and especially after 3,000 years ago from our samples from, from Pakistan, we see a new gradient forming. And this gradient is a mixture of individuals, sorry, this uh, line should actually point all the way up there um, rather than hitting the triangle here. Um, this gradient is a, a group that's a mixture uh, of, of different uh, proportions of ancestry from this Indus Valley related or Indus periphery climb gradient and uh, the steppe pastoralists. Um, but you still don't see people like South Asians today. <laughs> The ancestral North Indians fit well in modeling along this gradient. And then the ancestral South Indians form as an extreme point on this Indus Valley climb, um, more closely related to the groups with less Iranian ancestry. And people in South Asia today are mixtures of these two mixed populations. And we're, here's where the Indian groups fall. If you look at the proportion of ancestry coming from steppe pastoralists, genome-wide versus on the Y chromosome, you see today groups in India tend to be above the line, which tells you that similar to what happened in Iberia, more of the ancestry of these groups is coming along the Y chromosome than is coming up from the, ret from the maternal line. And so it's telling you that there's some degree of a socially unequal process coming, uh, occurring between these two groups um, as they mixed. <clears throat> Another phenomenon that's very interesting is that if you actually look at the groups that deviate from this mixed model that have too much steppe pastoralist Yamnaya-related ancestry compared to this model, they tend to be groups that are in the Brahmin or Bumihar groups. Brahmins are groups that are traditional custodians of the um, sacred uh, Vedic uh, Indo-European texts. And this provides a new line of evidence that those texts and that Indo-European culture is connected uh, with uh, steppe ancestry in particular, and that the bringing in of this steppe ancestry ultimately derived from the Yamnaya via late Bronze Age, middle to late Bronze Age groups that descend from them in part, um, is the source of these languages in Europe, uh, in, in, in South Asia that also spread to Europe. This also explains and probably explains why linguistically the languages of South Asia and Iran have a close cousin in Balto-Slavic languages like Lithuanian, because genetically uh, we can see that the middle to late Bronze Age groups are genetically very similar in these two regions. So the conclusion of this is that there's two parallel subcon uh, subcontinents of Eurasia, Europe and India. Farming forms uh, in the Near East uh, 11 to 12,000 years ago. It moves explosively both east and west after 9,000 years ago. <clears throat> and then it moves across these two subcontinents over the next few thousand years where people with farmer-related ancestry mix with local hunter-gatherers, um, moving slowly because it takes them time to adapt culturally perhaps and ecologically for sure to the new environments into which people are moving. Meanwhile, these people in the steppe north of the Black and Caspian Sea spread to the boundaries of both regions and then formed mixed populations and mixtures of these mixed populations drive the primary gradients in both regions today. So I'm going to conclude just in a little bit by talking about the extraordinarily high population substructure in South Asia today. Indian groups are much more genetically differentiated from each other groups today than European groups. We noticed this for the first time in 2009. There had been just a paper that claimed the opposite by studying actually not Indian groups from India, but Indian groups from the US and categorizing them by state. And there was very little differentiation. But when we looked at the sampling by 
based on traditional social status groups in different villages in India, there was huge differentiation, three or four times greater than the average differentiation between groups separated by much larger distances in Europe. And this didn't go away when we controlled by lang for language or traditional social status or by state of India. And the truth in India is that actually India today is not a large population like Han Chinese are a large population where people easily mix across different places and boundaries. In fact, in India is a large number of very small populations. There's at least about 5,000 well-defined groups and some people count many more where there's very little mixture across groups. What's actually happening is that many groups in India today are founder events with a relatively small number of individuals founding a large number of descendants today, anywhere from thousands to tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, or even millions, but rarely more than a few tens of millions. An example is the Vaisya from Andhra Pradesh, which is around Hyderabad today, uh, in the middle of the peninsular India. Um, and in this group, we were able to show using these chunks of DNA that are inherited from these founders who gave rise to a large fraction of the several million people in this group today, that the founder event is at least two to 3,000 years old. That is, a group two to 3,000 years ago was very successful in having offspring, and their kids were very successful in having offspring, and today they have many descendants today. So this is a really interesting finding because, for example, Nicholas Dirks in this argument, in this, in this book, Cast of Mind, argued that caste in modern India is an invention of colonialism in the sense that it became more rigid under colonial rule with the British using it as a way to govern India. And I'm sure that's true to an extent, but what he argued is that it really in many places effectively didn't exist prior to this time. However, groups like the Vaisya have remained endogamous with essentially no genetic flow into them from nearby groups that they were living very close to for two to 3,000 years. And what that means is that the strong endogamy rules in India today, at least in many groups, have been maintained. Um, as I say, genetics shows that many current distinctions are ancient and strong endogamy groups must have shaped marriage patterns for thousands of years. And what this is telling you is that genetics documented a cultural change after 5,000 years ago. As I mentioned to you before, there's this convulsive mixture process happening in South Asia. And then there's a profound switch to endogamy um, where groups have hardly mixed with each other for thousands of years in some cases. So what that's telling you, it's sort of... Um, talking to linguists and to uh, textual scholars, um, the earliest uh, Vedic texts, um, uh, 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 um, sacred texts in India, like the Rig Veda, um, describe a multi-ethnic society where, for example, people without Indo-European names are kings and poets in that society. But at the end, an appendix that's thought to be added later, uh, it describes the beginning of a system of social stratification. And within a few hundred years, another text, the Law Code of Manu, um, describes a very extensive system of social stratification related to the current caste system. And maybe we're seeing in textual evidence a parallel to this locking in of endogamy after a period of profound mixture that corresponds in time to the dates that we're talking about. I wanted to add a personal note just before I finish my talk that I myself come from an ancient caste. Um, Europeans don't have many castes, but there are a few of them. One of them is Ashkenazi Jews who have traditionally fulfilled uh, the definition of a caste. So one definition of a caste is a group that interacts economically but not socially with groups with which it lives among. For example, there are dietary rules or body modification strategies that prevent people from mixing with the groups they live among, but they have certain economic functions, for example, money lending or selling alcohol or other things. And that defines, has historically defined Ashkenazi Jews within Europe, at least some parts of Europe. So while I'm very much an outsider in India, this perspective very much is informed and some provides some kind of sympathy. I'm definitely acknowledged being a, a far outsider of my work in India. So in the Jewish community, in the Ashkenazi Jewish community, this is another founder event. 10 to 20 million people descend from a relatively small number of founders four or 500 years ago who had many descendants today. And as a result, people who are the product of a marriage between two Ashkenazi Jews are at elevated rate for diseases that due to one of the rare mutations carried in those founders. We all carry a few dozen mutations that would be lethal if we carried them in two copies. But if the founder, for the mutations carried by the founder, unfortunately, they got jacked up to high frequency because they had lots of kids. And if their descendants marry each other 20 generations later, you're in trouble. 
So in the Ashkenazi Jewish religious community, for example, some of my first cousins, there's a great deal of arranged marriage. And there's this uh, community testing service called Doria Sharim, which tests hundreds of high schools every uh, um, for um, uh, the standard set of known genetic Jewish mutations. And in the arranged marriage, it simply don't match up people who both carry the same mutation. They call them incompatible. And as a result, in Ashkenazi Jewish communities in Israel and the United States, the rates of these diseases like Tay-Sachs and Gaucher's disease has plummeted, gone to almost zero in these communities. Um, so in India, this seems like another medical opportunity, except instead of a one sort of relatively minor population like Ashkenazi Jews, the, the numbers here are very, very different. So um, what we found in a paper we published in 2017, that is a pro oh, here. approximately one third of Indians are from groups with clinically significant founder events, stronger than Ashkenazi Jews or Finns. So here is a rank ordering of uh, 250 uh, Indian groups in the survey that we did by the strength of their founder events. Here's where Jews are, and a third of them have stronger founder events than Ashkenazi Jews or Finns. Uh, here's the Vaisya, which is about the same strength as Ashkenazi Jews or Finns. Uh, here's many groups that are much stronger, including groups with millions of people in them, and very, very strong founder events, which would result in proportionally many more recessive diseases. So there's every opportunity to do the same thing in South Asia as in Doria Sharim, where, for example, where there's also a lot of arranged marriage in South Asia, as well as you could do just testing uh, uh, in utero testing, there's ethical issues about doing all this, but I just want to highlight this as an opportunity. Literally, probably more than 100,000 uh, lethal recessive diseases are in India every year uh, due to this process. And right now, the ability to discover what these are is, is really trivial right now with modern genetic technology. It's not even expensive, but there's not a lot of attention to this opportunity in South Asia. Instead, genetic attention is more toward common things that are common across South Asia, not specific to each group, like type, specific types of diabetes or metabolic syndrome or heart disease, which of course are also very important. Um, so there's a lot of opportunity to do that. So I want to conclude by thanking you. I think that I want to highlight the parallel history of South Asia and Europe, tell you that there were these similarities, the movement of farming or farming uh, uh, or of people influenced by farming into both regions, mixing with local hunter-gatherers, then the impact of people descended from steppe pastoralists who spread after 5,000 years ago. Of course, very important profound differences as well. And in general, these are just two instances of what's being revealed again and again by ancient DNA, which is that mixing of groups as extremely different from each other is a common feature of human nature. You might think you live in unusual times with the people coming across the Atlantic and Africans, Europeans, and Native Americans and East Asians all mixing together in the Americas. But in fact, we're not in an unusual time. The equally profound events have occurred again and again in our past and have formed us and are in all of our histories. Um, and there's really no, no groups that are pure or have their ancestors have really been in the same place forever. Um, but I think we should learn from that and really feel more connected from that rather than more separate. Thank you. So now we're going to have some time for Q&A, and I'm just going to run microphones around the room for people. I have a question. Um, from your research thousands, for thousands of years, uh, stemming or uh, probing back into human history, uh, in modern times, in the last couple of thousand years, Humans have been very warlike and they very, seem to be very violent. Do you have any idea from your research that uh, humans were less engaged with warfare than they are today, or is there no research? So the question is, uh, the, the, question, the question is, um, humans, uh, there's a lot of history of war and conflict in the last thousands of years that we know about from the historical record, and does the research provide any information about that? I think the best research on this topic is from archaeology, um, where really you can actually try to understand whether there's evidence of war. Um, and I think that archaeologists are quite consistent in showing that sort of war in the form that we know it, with these organized large groups fighting each other, is a very recent phenomenon just of the last few thousand years. Um, because uh, there aren't state-scale societies prior to that. 
Um, however, conflict is common in the past, and what you can see in the genetic data are mixtures between groups that differently involve males and females. And what that's telling you is that you're seeing unequal mixtures of groups. That's what I discuss as one of the topics in this uh, chapter of my book called The Genomics of Inequality, where surprisingly genetics is giving you evidence of asymmetry in the mixture process between groups. So I think that it's tempting to think when you see the example of the Yamnaya of kind of horseback riders coming from the steppes, kind of pillaging Europe or something like this. But that's an anachronistic picture. These people possibly could, probably couldn't ride horses. They didn't have stirrups. They couldn't shoot a bow and arrow from a horse. Uh, they didn't work in organized bands of that scale. Um, however, they nevertheless did move across Europe, and their descendants sort of uh, produced these very asymmetric uh, mixture events that we observe. So I think it provides important observations, data points, that provide the archaeologist with new information to contextualize within the archaeological record and to see how groups in the past might relate to groups today in terms of behavior. Thank you. This is sort of a technical question, but I didn't understand something you were saying about the um, groups moving into Iberia uh, with the the, pastor the step pastoralists moving in. Um, you said that 100% um, uh, of the male ancestors were the step pastoralists, but only 40% of the overall ancestors were step pastoralists. But aren't half of the ancestors of any individual male? So am I just misunderstanding something about the the arithmetic there? So, okay, the question is, um, it's a great question. So the question is, uh, what can you, you're basically asking me to explain what I mean by difference between the whole genome ancestry coming from step pastoralists and the Y chromosome ancestry. Yeah. And I think the right way to say this is to ask, um, what fraction of your ancestors were living outside Iberia several hundred years ago before this mixture event occurred? And the answer is, um, on any random genealogical line, say your mother's father's mother's 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 father, 40% only live outside Iberia. But on one particular line, your father's 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 father's, what percent of those ancestors live outside Iberia? And the answer to that is 100%. In fact, the event is more extreme than I told you, because, um, because that 40% is the number of people who live outside of Iberia, but actually the people who came into Iberia were already half farmer by that time. And so actually it's only 20% step ancestry that makes it into Iberia, but it's nearly 100% on the Y chromosome on the entire male line. So what you're seeing is the result of a very asymmetric process where males from the step are successfully propagating their genes event on the entirely male line into Iberia. You see phenomena like this also in more recent times. For example, uh, 5 to 10 percent of the Y chromosomes in large parts of East Asia descend from a single common ancestor maybe 800, 900, 1,000 years ago. And what that's telling you is that some individual at that time fathered um, males who fathered males who fathered males who are responsible for literally, you know, uh, you know, hundreds of millions of people. Um, and, you know, that corresponds to the Mongol spread and, you know, the time maybe of Genghis Khan, where the, we, there's known documented it's very extreme social stratification. And we see other events in the genetic literature which are much more impressive than that. For example, if you actually look at reconstructed population sizes on the entirely female line, and I talk about this in that chapter I'm mentioning, um, on the mitochondrial DNA, you actually and tr track the expansion of human populations. Populations are pretty small before 50,000 years ago. Then after 10,000 years ago, they grow a lot, associated with the time of spread of agriculture. And then they keep growing after that time with no obvious interruption. If you do the same thing on the Y chromosome, you see the same 50,000 years ago ex um, population expansion. And you see the same expansion with agriculture, but there's a huge crash about 5,000 years ago, not seen on the mitochondrial DNA. And what that's telling you is that individual males four, five, six thousand years ago 
are successfully propagating their genes much more effectively than other males. And what that's telling... This is not differences between the sexes, but rather inequalities among males in terms of ability to propagate their genes. And this period corresponds to the first period in the archaeological record with extreme wealth concentration, where the first time you see treasures and graves, for the first time you see uh, great inequalities of wealth. And what this seems to be telling you is that that's accompanied also by extreme inequities um, in which males get to reproduce. Possibly there's also extreme inequities in female wealth, but you don't see that as much because females don't have the same dynamic range of number of offspring as males do. This is fascinating. You'll have enough to keep you busy for a long time. But looking into the further future, how much further in the past can you look? In other words, what sets, if you know, the fundamental limits on how long DNA can last? The question is about ancient DNA preservation. The oldest ancient DNA of substantial quality is about a 700,000-year-old horse from permafrost from Alaska. Um, the oldest human DNA, which is much poorer quality, is about four or 500,000 years ago from Spain. It's an early Neanderthal lineage individual uh, that was sequenced a couple of years ago. Um, and that's probably... It would probably be unlikely, most people think, that DNA will preserve much more than a million years in substantial amounts. So we're really not going to learn about probably dinosaurs or, you know, Miocene evolution uh, except to the extent that those lineages have left lineages that we can sample with ancient DNA that are now extinct. A question there. Hi, thanks. You're forgetting about Jurassic Park. Maybe we will learn about dinosaurs. Um, no, uh, so you drew some attention in the popular press about, and maybe I'm getting this not exactly correct, but something about like there's more variation within races versus across races. I guess, obviously, the definition of race could be uh, tricky at times. But this analysis would tell me that there actually is more variation within, quote-unquote, races than the, 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 I think, popular notion you were trying to refute. Did I, did I state that properly, or did I get that? The, the question was how... I'm going to try to restate your question and, and tell me if it's not, not a restating that you're is what, in the direction what you want. I think you're asking about, on the one hand, how this relates to conventional notions of, quote, races. Um, that's part of your question. And uh, the other question is what this data and what genetic findings mean about the degree of variation amongst human populations and how much that apportions in the groups versus individuals. And so... <laughs> so... Um, so the first thing to say about that is race is clearly a social concept. People, it's, the categories are different in different countries in the world, uh, and it's really a description of how people see each other and categorize each other in a group. Um, and um, while it correlates in some cases to genetic groupings, in other cases, for example, in the Latinos, it doesn't, which includes people of entirely European ancestry, mostly African ancestry, Native American and uh, European ancestry with very little African ancestry, so it's a heterogeneous genetic grouping. So um, uh, it's a social idea that explains a lot of cultural variation, but it has, and sometimes correlated to genetic variation, but uh, not a perfect one-to-one -one matching. We geneticists, ne I, in my work, I never use this in my papers because it's so loaded with cultural and historical baggage that it makes it an imprecise term, and we just don't use that term. We use terms like ancestry instead, not as, as a euphemism for race, but in an attempt to describe concepts of genetic differentiation across individuals and groups um, without all that baggage and that loading. So the second question is about the degree of variation within and across groups. And uh, I'm in completely agreement with what's been determined from genetics for almost the last 50 years, beginning with a paper by Richard Lewington, who worked here in 1972, I think, uh, who um, uh, pointed out that the degree of genetic variation between any two individuals within this room is on average six times greater than the average variation between the average, the, 
uh, between two groups across the room. So most of the differences that you can appreciate amongst people are much larger than the average differences across groups. Um, I think that perhaps the issues you're referring to are related to um, the work, uh, the, the writing I was doing to try to emphasize that while those differences are small relative to the great differences you see amongst people in this room, they're not nothing. And we need to actually develop a language to actually think about how to, how, to, how to accommodate those differences in our public discourse, because if we don't, the geneticists are going to find these differences anyway, and we're, it's, I think that we need to develop a robust way to talk about these small differences that do exist. Uh, you talked a couple times about replacement events. Do we have like any way of knowing what that word means in terms of like was it violent or just like disease? Yeah, the question is replacement events. So that's a possibly problematic word. Um, so uh, in the case of Britain 6,000 years ago, uh, the population that you sample after 6,000 years ago and before 6,000 years ago, 99% of the ancestors of people 6,000 years ago or more can't have lived in Britain based on the sampling that's been done. So what does that mean? Uh, does it mean that the new people came in and killed the local people? Does it mean that they crowded them out because they had used uh, resources more efficiently and those people just were absorbed perhaps through mixture or just were not as successful at reproducing because their lives were less efficient or they were displaced from their lands? We just don't know. What the genetic data does is it provides facts about movements of people, uh, changes in ancestry, relationships amongst groups, but we are not the experts and we are not really uh, able to really describe what happened. And you know, maybe it will never be possible, but I think that needs to be done in the context of the archeology span uh, as using the genetic data as one source of information to try to learn what might have happened. So really I've been trying to use words that really don't prejudge what happened. Again, in Britain, uh, about 44 to 4,500 years ago, there was this new massive influx of people coming in within a period that can at most be a couple of hundred years. What does that mean in terms of the facts on the ground? I don't know, but it actually happened, so we have to deal with it and think about it somehow. Uh, hi, uh, question. Uh, the original farmers that went to India and Europe, how closely related were they? Uh, you mentioned in your book there was a huge difference between the Zagros, Iranian, early farmers, and the eleven to teen peoples. And yeah. where did the Anatolians fit in the Western ones? So farming, one of the findings of our 2016 work is that farming, eleven to twelve thousand years ago, developed in a multi-ethnic society world where uh, different types of um, crops like wheat and barley uh, or goat domestication happened in um, different parts of the Near East, all the way from Western Iran to uh, Eastern Turkey to the Levant. Um, and those groups genetically are extremely different from each other. So ancient Iranian early farmers and herders are as different from uh, Eastern Anatolians and Western Anatolians as Europeans and East Asians are from each other. And in fact, 10,000 years ago in this region, there were multiple groups in Western Eurasia where today there's a lot of homogeneity that were as different from each other as Europeans and East Asians. So farming was developed in this multi-ethnic society, and in the subsequent few thousand years, these groups all expanded in different directions and mixed with each other and glommed together to form the region of relatively relative homogeneity that we see today. The ancestry that moved into Europe was from the western end of that gradient, um, the Anatolian farmer-related end, and was very different than the type that moved into South Asia, or that developed or spread in South Asia, which is more related to Iranian farmers. And so what you're actually seeing is not the same population, but different groups that are quite differentiated from each other, from each other within the core region of the Near East. So the Levantine group is actually probably, is yet again quite different. And actually what you see in terms of the spread into Africa and mixture with local groups is related to the Levantine groups. We don't know if it's from the Levant itself or from a North African population that was related to it. But in any case, the West Eurasian related ancestry that you see admixing after 5,000 years ago in East Africa is um, uh, uh, more closely related to the Levantine than to the Anatolian or the Iranian groups. So we have time for about one or two more questions. Question. 
Hi. Um, I was curious that I assume that population migration was largely happening along waterways, but that the domestication of the horse obviously played a critical role to the movement of populations. And I'm wondering if there is another research group that is studying the ancient DNA of horses and whether perhaps what they're seeing supports the movements that you're seeing with the human DNA. This question, uh, uh, what does genetics say about horses? I've just talked about humans and arguably much more interesting things to be said about other animals. Um, there's actually a particularly amazing research group based in France right now, led by Ludovic Orlando, that's been studying the ancient DNA of horses. And of all the ancient DNA work going on, you know, it's very impressive work, maybe more impressive than a lot of the work that I've told you about. Um, we still don't know where the domestication of the horses that are all around today uh, occurred. The first horse domestication occurred in Central Asia um, in uh, a culture that's been called the Botai culture about 40, 5,500 years ago in present-day Kazakhstan. And the ancient DNA of those horses in a published paper from Orlando's group last year um, uh, showed that these groups are not related to modern horses, these first domesticated horse. They're instead related to Przewalski's horses, which are the wild horses of Mongolia today that were thought to be wild horses, but that work showed that in fact Przewalski's horse are feral domesticated botai horses that went wild. And in fact, there are no purely wild horses left anymore. In fact, they're all domesticated or feralized domesticated horses, almost for sure. It's a possible that it's a question where the first horses were domesticated. A possibility is that it was the Yamnaya itself and that the horses they used and widely used spread. And I think that will be a really exciting thing to see in the coming years. But uh, horses, cattle, goats, wild animals, extinctions, and trying to gain some insight in why the mammoths and the um, uh, different megafauna went extinct is all something that can and is being addressed with ancient DNA. Thank you. Hi. Um, so uh, I thought it was very interesting when you showed the map of South Asia, like particularly I think in the Swat Valley, the uh, percentage of um, the, I guess, the Indo-European uh, ancestry you saw was uh, really high. So I'm just curious that, did you see any consistent, like, gradation, like, as you move eastward, uh, that the, like, the populate, like, the Indian populations who live, like, more on the eastern part of the country have uh, more of the uh, South Indian ancestry, com uh, ancestral so South Indians compared to, like, the like the northwestern uh, part of the uh, subcontinent. So the question is, what are the, how do the gradients correlate to geography? Um, and I think the uh, and I think that broadly it's a northwest to southeastern gradient, but really the the smallest proportions of steppe pastoralist ancestry are from the south of India, and especially in groups that are traditionally outside the caste system, some tribal groups that speak Dravidian languages. In eastern India, in the, what's called the tribal belt, there are groups that have even less steppe and Iranian farmer-related ancestry than the groups in southern India. Um, and these groups often speak Austroasiatic languages and are particularly interesting and revealing for what's going on because it's clear that they derive part of their ancestry from the deep hunter-gatherer related component of South Asian ancestry uh, that is most Indian groups is only present in form mixed with Iranian farmer-related ancestry. And so what that tells you is that at the time that Austroasiatic languages came into South Asia, they almost certainly came from the east, likely associated with the spread of rice farming from the east. Um, and after 5,000 years ago, these people, when they spread in, were encountering groups that had not yet become the ASI, um, it, who we know actually formed through mixture after 4,000 years ago. And so in the east of India, you actually do see these groups that are sampling from the pres previous uh, 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 variation without this impact of Iranian farmer-related ancestry. All right. I think that wraps up our program tonight. Thank you. Thank you.